Hello friends, good afternoon and welcome to Edusat Live Lectures. Dear friends, as you know that we have started a series on Indian political thought and today we are conducting yet another lecture in the same series. In today's lecture, we will try and understand the political thought of poet and laureate Iqbal. In, this, in his political thought, we will try and understand Iqbal's idea of self, his ideas of democracy and his perception of modernity. To discuss this topic, we have with us our subject expert, Dr. Marindana Thakur. Dr. Thakur is Associate Professor in Center for Political Studies, School of Social Sciences, JNU. Without further ado, I would like to welcome Sir to our studios and request him to start the lecture. Welcome, Sir. Thank you. I think uh, Iqbal is uh, one of the most complicated thinkers uh, in modern India. So what I'll do is I'll let, I'll try to first introduce the idea of uh, modern Indian thought within which we have to place Iqbal, and then I'll get into Iqbal's idea of Khudi, and I will argue that how his idea of Khudi is the core idea around which his ideas on democracy, uh, on nationalism, and on reconstruction of Islam could be based. If you look at the history of modern Indian thought, one of the current, one of the context, of course, of the modern Indian thought is that we had a past, a past where religious philosophies were quite dominant, and broadly speaking, Indian society was constituted around religious philosophies. I am not saying those religious philosophies were not also knowledge systems. I think in fact the religious philosophies were certain kind of knowledge systems around which the everyday life of human beings in this region was constituted. Modernity's advent created a major crisis as there is an epistemological tension between religious philosophy and modernity. I will come to that point how that epistemological tension always created a problem for Indian thinkers. Then the third thing was of course the colonial domination, the colonial powers coming to India and colonial power as state power or when it acquired the state power used the idea of modernity for its hegemonic dominance. So, what we got at the end of the day was modernity, modernization and modernism together with colonialism. Therefore, Indian, modern Indian thinking always remain a bit in problem whether to support modernity or not to support modernity and that kind of problem problematic you can see in everybody's ideas. Some of the thinkers have wondered why Indian thinkers who were against colonial power were using the same discourse, the same idea of modernity. I think the reason was that they were fighting against many enemies together. The enemy of colonialism was there, the enemy of modern market democracy or modern market state system, a uh, state system which was supporting uh, a modern market was the second enemy which was dehumanizing human being and third was of course the internal enemy, the conservatives within all these religious traditions were ha also having their own ruling elites and those ruling elites were controlling uh, the resources in these areas and they, Im they introduced and number of conservative ideas in our society. So, these thinkers were fighting three things together. You take anybody, you take Gandhi, Ambedkar, Tagore or uh, Iqbal. Everybody I think 
was facing number of enemies together. So as a general principle, they were on the one hand trying to give a critique of the tradition which was not actually pro-human or which at times worked against humanity, but they were also trying to draw upon resources from there, from the tradition, so that they could counter the another enemy that is colonialism. They were not against modernity, but they were against colonial use of modernity. So you find these thinkers little complicated. If you do not understand them in a comprehensive way, you will assume that they were either traditionalist or modernist or at best between modernity and tradition. I would request you to look at them from a very different angle. I would suggest that these thinkers were facing a time when the major domination was through colonialism and they wanted to get rid of that, but they also had a, an alternative notion of ideal society and therefore they were trying to produce what I call philosophy of human liberation. All of them were having their own vantage points, all of them were having their own locations from where they were trying to theorize the meaning of liberation and the locations defined their broad contours also, but you have to see them as, as thinkers sharing their common goal of universal human liberation. If you look at like this, then you will find that these thinkers were making certain very, very significant points and there were common elements among these thinkers too. Let me come to Iqbal. Iqbal is more complicated, as I said in the beginning, Iqbal is more complicated thinker. Why did I say that? I said that because I think here is a person who is liked by everybody. Nehru and Zina, they were opposed to each other, but both of them praised Iqbal. India and Pakistan, even now, differ on everything except one thing that Iqbal, Iqbal was a great thinker. There were followers of Iqbal in Pakistan at that time and there were followers of Iqbal in India at that time and even today you will find followers on both the sides. Some people say Iqbal, Iqbal was a fascist, he was a fascist thinker, some people say he is a great democratic thinker, some people say he is a traditionalist, he, he, he was he's an Islamist, Islamist philosopher, he's, he's, he thinks that pan-Islamism uh, was a solution of, of uh, uh, humanity. Some other thinkers think that no, he transformed Islam into a more democratic philosophy and religion. So you have variety of opinions about, varieties of opinion about Iqbal and it is not surprising. It is not surprising for the reason that Iqbal was a political philosopher, a political activist, uh, a poet and many things together. And also he had experience of many kinds, for instance his grandfather converted into Islam and before converting to Islam he was, he was a Kashmiri Brahmin and I am sure conversion might change their, their present, but the collective consciousness of which they were part that must have continued with them. So he had some experience directly or indirectly of the Hindu society, Kashmiri Hindu philosophy. Then he became a Muslim, part of the Muslim milieu and then of course he went abroad and he studied in Cambridge and happened to read uh, Nietzsche and many other philosophers of the time. So he was exposed to Western modernity and he was exposed to the debates about Islam and India and philosophy of this region in Cambridge. So here is a man who has variety of experiences and he, he was gifted power 
to express them in prose and poetry. And therefore, to comprehend Iqbal is not an easy thing. And the last but not the least, that the same man who wrote famous lines that Sare Jahan Se hind, Achha Hindusta Hamara, the same person was also an architect of Pakistan, the first person to suggest that Pakistan should be made. So he is full of contradictions, at least apparently it looks like that. And there are number of writings on each aspects of each aspect of, of uh, uh, Iqbal. The task I have taken here is to look at the coherence in Iqbal as a political philosopher, as a modern political philosopher, and if I, I, can, be, I can say a modern Indian political philosopher. When I am saying modern Indian philosopher, political philosopher, that would mean that the way India was, was constituted at that time and the way this philosopher can be located in the history of ideas in Indian subcontinent. The most important point that we must remember that the Asian society at that time, forget about only India, Asian society at the time was quite a vibrant society and it had a huge philosophical tradition. It is not that the white man, white men come here, came here and civilized them. The Asian society had its own tradition. You have highly developed classical Indian tradition of philosophy. You have different kinds of Islamic philosophies and Rumi was one of the great representatives. Following him there was a huge movement of Sufism. So in this subcontinent, in South Asia particularly, you find that philosophy is coming from different parts of the world and making this their habitation and engaging with other philosophies and creating new philosophies was not a new thing. It was quite this kind of cross fertilization was part of culture of South Asia of which Iqbal could be considered one of the best representatives. Let me, let me come to his specific context. His specific context was that he was trying to read Quran and modernity simultaneously. Not that he was trying to give a modern interpretation of Quran, in fact he opposed that, but he was trying to read Quran as a Muslim follower and in a very different way. I will come to that when I will discuss about his ideas on religion, but let me just introduce this idea that Quran for him was an epistemological text and that epistemological text was different from the modern epistemology of the West and therefore he was trying to see that how with that epistemology, with the epistemology that was available in Quran in particular and in religion in general, how could that look at the world differently today? How could that constitute a world differently today? Therefore, there was a critique of modernity in him, but at the same time he was not rejecting democracy, he was not rejecting many institutions of, of modernity the larger principles of modernity, he wanted to read them through the epistemology available in Quran and therefore that reading he thought would give us new kinds of institutions, new kinds of philosophical foundation for our emerging society. This is the larger particular context of, of Iqbal. Now it is in this context the most crucial contribution of Iqbal was to anchor his philosophy on the idea of khudi, which is translated as idea of the self. 
So, what is the idea of the khudi? It is not individuality. Let us be very clear about it. In fact, he was opposed to the liberal idea of individuality. Look at the liberal idea of individuality. What was it? It was highly anthropocentric that you are the human beings are at the center of the universe and the individual is completely owner of his own, own self. He, he is an individual, he or she is an individual who has a right to do whatever possible. So, you remember Hobbes, Locke and Rousseau, what was their argument? The argument was that individuals were having all rights and they were free to do whatever they wanted. The only problem was that by doing this that kind of thing, there was a society that was created in which life, liberty and property was a problem. That is a social contract general argument. Since it was a problem either due to their bad nature or good nature declining into bad nature due to anarchy, whatever it was, but then they enter into a contract to create a society. Now, why did you create a society or a state and a state? They created it to protect that individuality, to protect that right of the individual and that right of the individual can be thought of as absolute right. So, my right is so absolute that your presence is a threat to my right, is a threat to my liberty. But I know that your presence is necessary, therefore I will tolerate that. So, the idea of tolerance came. So, this way of looking at human beings is a basic liberal way of looking at human beings. I think Akbal rejected this idea or what you call rejected the idea of the possessive individualism. The possessive individualism is the idea that has been articulated by C. B. Macpherson and that C. B. Macpherson thinks is the core idea of the emerging modernity of these thinkers, Hobbes, Locke and Rousseau kind of thinkers. This is the idea which was creating a big problem in modern times. You remember, even Gandhi had a problem with this idea that we are isolated atomized individuals having control on all our rights. We are the, we are the center of universe and we have right to be free absolutely and we are the possessor of all our qualities. So, Gandhi in order to counter this, he argued that oh we are all lonies, we are born in this nature, in the society. So, after the birth we have taken many loans from people, one who allowed us to help us to survive in this world, who brought us to the world. So, therefore, our, our parents, our teachers, society in general, we have taken loans from them and we have to return those loans in order to repay that and returning would be through good deeds towards society. So, this was a problem because if you assume that human beings are selfish individuals, then a collective action becomes almost impossible. Then you do not emerge, they do not survive as a collective, collective community. You can survive only if it is rationally possible, but community is not always rationally possible. So, the idea of the nation required certain kind of emotion, certain kind of commitment. To build up a nation rationally would have been a difficult task to perform. Therefore, Gandhi and others thought that in order to, if, if they wanted to analyze, to organize any collective action, there has to be some commitment, a transfactual commitment transcendental commitment and therefore, they thought in this way. Iqbal similarly thought that the notion of the self needed to be redefined. So, that on the one hand we retain that autonomy as an individual, but 
we also have the commitment to the community. Now, these, these two ends he wanted to make meet and therefore that is how he defined, defined the idea of the, of, of the khudi. So, at one level the self is the me, the I amness, the me and my all requirements, my all needs with me. So, I am looking towards my existence as human being and I require all those things which I need for my physical survival. At that level we are almost like any living being that we our biological survival, our physical survival is necessary and therefore, we need to acquire things from the nature for our survival. To that extent, we are very close to any other living being. But then Iqbal goes beyond that and then he says that here is a living being as human beings whose self is not merely the I amness, his self is also the other, the relation with the other. So, other has your self is defined by the other. You are not pure individual, not self is individual, rather you are being in the society, you are being in the society and therefore, you have to define and redefine yourself according to the people around. So, you cannot be selfish. I am reminded of Marx's argument that my freedom should be your freedom should be guaranteed to my freedom or the vice versa, my freedom should be guaranteed to your freedom. Because you do exist with me and in fact, when one can go to the other extent saying that I, you, I exist because you exist. So, my, the purpose of my life is not only me, not only my, my physical survival, my biological survival, but purpose of my life is to help others also in surviving, to engage in this relationship with other human beings because, because this body also has a mind and mind is emotional. It has a feeling, it has a feeling for other human beings. I think this is also one of the critiques of modernity in a way. Modernity is foundation stone is Cartesian dualism, which treated human beings as machines and from there it emerges the idea of the self as individual, as rational individual cons consist consistently and constantly working for its own survival. Iqbal goes beyond that and he says that we are not merely like any other living beings, we are also more than that and therefore, our relation with other is extremely important. Our emotional relation is extremely important. So, this is what my relation with the other and the other this is important dimension of my existence. I cannot exist alone. Then the third form is the self and the God and this is a new dimension and this is the dimension which you will find in many of the Indian thinkers. I will come to that. So, human beings have what is called mind and the mind cannot be reduced to the brain. The mind and brain are two different things and human mind is capable of transcendental imaginations, capable of going beyond the limitations of physical existence and human mind can connect with something called God, God is not an entity, it is an abstraction for Iqbal. So, one can connect with that. In fact, in fact, Iqbal thinks that God is the epitome of the highest form of being. So, what you do is you access yourself, accessing the self is connecting to the God, is accessing the God. So, there is the, what, what Marx calls the species being qualities. So, if you have, if you try to achieve 
the species being qualities, you are trying to access the God or what Indian philosophy says that if you go into the layers of consciousness and the highest layer of consciousness, when you connect yourself with the infinity and you become, you think that you are part of that infinity, that is the experience, the ecstasy, that ecstasy is the, the, the experience of the God. So it is not outside anywhere, it is part of your being, it is part of the, of the universe, part of your, your consciousness. So it is the layer, certain layer of consciousness where you acquire that the unique ecstasy which is God. So Iqbal tries to bring the human being at the center of the thinking, not like the western thinking, but very much like the eastern thinking where human being is at the core of of the, uh, of the philosophy. It has long, long implications and I will talk about long implications of bringing human being and human consciousness and this transcendental feeling of humans at the core of the philosophy. You can find it in Tagore when he talks of the bowels. The bowels are exactly suggesting that human beings are of that kind who can achieve that abstraction and if you achieve that abstraction, you achieve that connectivity with the God. You have Gandhi and you have political implications of this kind of thinking to which I will, I will discuss. is accessing the self and accessing the self at three layers. First layer is the layer of physical existence, second layer is the layer of relational existence and third layer is the layer of universal existence. These three layers of human existence equal things is a part of the being, being the self. Now what is the implication of this? One implication is that Iqbal would oppose to those people who would always like to stay at high abstraction. So he was, his relation with the Sufis was very complicated. On the one hand, he agreed with the Sufis that this kind of ecstasy was possible. He agreed that this kind of ecstasy was also desirable, but then what? This kind of ecstasy should not allow one to get rid of other two aspects of the self, the self as physical being and self as relational being. Iqbal thought that one has to exist at all three levels simultaneously and influencing each other simultaneously. I think if you look at Gandhi, when Gandhi talks of Swaraj, he also talks of something very similar and Gandhi's idea of the self is something very similar. That you have to exist as human being in everyday life, you have to exist as relational being in everyday life and you have to also exist as a spiritual being in everyday life and all three are not isolated, all three are interconnected and impacting each other. So what is the implication of this for everyday life and everyday politics? 
The implication of this for everyday life is that you emerge as a better human beings. You emerge as a better human being because you are constantly remembering that whatever you are doing at the moment are part of the huge universe. These things are part of the huge universe and therefore, it is part of your existence. So, you do not get attached to them so much. You move from one to the other. In the relations, you become much more democratic because you think that the other is part of your being. Both of you simultaneously are part of the universal being and therefore, your relation with the other becomes much more democratic. Now, this is the foundation of a new kind of politics, a politics which is not based on self interest or selfish interest of individual articulated into groups, but this is a politics of selflessness. This is a politics, here politics is defined very differently than the politics would be for the welfare of the people of the humanity. It will not be limited to some people of your own clan or community, because you do not isolate, you do not differentiate between them. They are human beings like you and you think you are part of them and they are part of you. So, you think of a different kind of politics. It has deep impact on the idea of the violence. You will not really become violent if you think the other person is part of you. He or she may be doing something wrong, but that wrong could be corrected as Gandhi said that heart can be changed. But there is a, a, a unique relationship between two human beings. I think Iqbal would agree with this, this idea. His, his idea of the Khudi allows him to imagine a different kind of politics. And this different kind of politics, he thinks, is based on his understanding of Quran and his reconstruction of religion. Now, let me talk about his religion a little bit. I think this is where we need to understand that how Iqbal was convinced of the epistemic frame of Quran. What is the epistemic frame of Quran? That you are existing for humanity. You are existing for humanity. There are everyday life problems. Those problems should be solved in a way that you do not damage the humanity. And there is a notion of human being in Quran, where you can think that human being has the capacity to access the God, because by accessing the God you are accessing yourself. So, if that is the core idea of religion, that religion means accessing the self, religion means that you access your godly qualities and you become godly human being in the real life and godly would mean that you become a real human being in real life. If that is the core idea of religion, then Iqbal thought that this idea is much more advanced compared to what the West is right now propagating. Because at that time, the, the philosophy of the modernity was deeply embedded in the philosophy of Descartes and philosophy of science of Newton and all, who thought that seeing is knowing. What you can see, what you can observe and you can generalize, only that could be considered as knowledge. Iqbal would suggest with the help of Quranic epistemology that feeling could also should also be considered as knowing. The feeling is is part of the human being's quality and feeling was also knowing. Of course, seeing could be knowing, but one cannot reduce the knowing to seeing. One has to understand that feeling can also be knowing and feeling of existence of the energy around, feeling of existence of other human being, feeling that other human being are part of your life, your being. You are the same, the other is the same there is no otherness. I think that kind of idea epistemologically, epistemologically Iqbal thought was much superior to what, what the modern West was suggesting. And the modernity of course, was against religion. 
because this epistemology was not acceptable to, to, to Newtonian science. Iqbal thought that on the one hand, what Europeans have done was important in the sense that democratizing society was important. Considering every human being as important was important. Taking every human being into account when thinking of creating a social system was, a, was important. Allowing everybody to express one's own opinion was important. But at the same time, this kind of mechanical relationship would not create an ideal society. When you are allowed to express yourself, then you have to have an inner self which must guide you. Your self is self, it, if it starts guiding you, then what you constitute finally cannot be a good society. There has to be the inner self which must guide you, not merely a selfish individual, but as selfless human being working not for the self only, but for working for the self, but not for the selfish interest, working for the self and also working for the human species. If that kind of understanding is there, then Iqbal would say that is the better system and, and religion has many dimensions. Probably what Iqbal was talking about was the philosophy of religion and the ethics of religion. The other dimension was, of course, rituals of religion. This is where Iqbal thought that over the years, over the decades and centuries, Islam probably has got into many rituals in order to follow others. It has transformed. One has to reclaim the original Islam, reconstitute the original Islam. I think this is an idea that was quite prevalent at that time because most of the thinkers were fighting against the conservatism and, and anti-human rituals of a particular religion that they belong to. But simultaneously they were also arguing that there are certain resources extremely important, larger epistemic frame was extremely important that must be reclaimed and reestablished. Iqbal's idea of re rethinking Islam is not making Islam modern. Many people were thinking that Islam should have been modern. On the one hand, he was not with the Sufis. On the other hand, he was not with the modernist Islams who thought that one has to read everything that is modern in Quran. Iqbal was not for that. Iqbal thought that the specificity of Quran epistemic frame must be maintained. And so was Gandhi. And so was Tagore. I think they, all of them were almost arguing the same thing, which ultimately culminated into what you call the liberation theology. Liberation theology retains that epistemic frame of religion, but counters the ruling class, de, de mystif, uh, de ruling class mystification of religion or misuse of religion by creating various kinds of rituals. So, on the one hand, spirituality was important. On the other hand, the practice has to be remodeled according to the spirituality. The practice which has accommodated with the contemporary world, Iqbal thought that that has to remodel so that you can move towards real democracy. A lot of people think Iqbal was against democracy. I do not think so. I think Iqbal was talking about a form of democracy where ethics becomes very important. I think he was talking of ethical democracy. And without ethics, if the market guides democracy, there is a big problem and Iqbal was aware of that. He was very clear about it, that if you give importance to Khudi so much, then you can never be undemocratic. Because Khudi is, is not about a race, it is not about a community, it is about human beings. So, all human beings are equal, all human beings have right to be 
conscious about the self. All human beings have right to access the best possible self. If that is true, then there is no scope for racism. There is no scope for discrimination against any human being on any ground. So, that is Iqbal's democracy. Iqbal's democracy is not majoritarianism. Iqbal's democracy, that is very formal democracy which Iqbal thought might not work actually. What you need is substantive democracy. What you need a democracy much more well defined, a decent society, a democracy where human beings have capacity to understand the transcendental reality, capacity to understand the human species qualities and go beyond the selfish interest and not merely sticking to majoritarianism. Majority or minority taking decisions through majority and protecting the minority. This is a, a very functional model of democracy. It is not the philosophy of democracy. The philosophy of democracy is highly egalitarian. I think Iqbal retained that idea of egalitarianism and thought that there was a need to work on many institutions and probably in Quran, in the, in the Islamic tradition, several such institutions were available and therefore one would have gone. It is like Gandhi who thought that there should be oceanic circle, not the party system. So, that way they, they were thinking almost alike, drawing upon their own traditions, they were trying to argue that there are, there are alternatives to modern institutions and modern thinking. Similarly, Iqbal's idea of nationalism. The democracy that Iqbal thought of, the khudi that Iqbal thought of would definitely mean that the idea of nation state is not, would not be sustainable. He thought that if you divide humanity in nation states and then put them into rivalry, there will be a big problem. The nation state ultimately is based on certain kind of identity and certain kind of creating the otherness. It creates the otherness. And in fact, the more otherness it creates, more consolidation of nation takes place. So, instead of thinking of nation state, you think of communities, you think of creating society where no differentiation exists. I think this was a very, very radical idea at the time and very close to what Tagore used to argue or even Gandhi was talking of civilization, not of nation. Gandhi also was aware of the dangers of nation state. Tagore of course, was a great champion of internationalism, going beyond the boundaries of nation state. He was, he always warned that nation is a dangerous thing, but it might create problem to you. Idea of nation may be used to pursue the exploitative relationship within. Iqbal was aware of that. So, he said that no such identity politics should happen. Society should be egalitarian. Every human being should have opportunity to realize oneself to the highest possible potential. And if that is provided and such human beings would be deciding for things, they will be guided by the highest realm of the khudi that is their relation with the God, that is godly human being. So, if the godly human being have to decide about things, a democracy which based, is based on that, you do not need a nation state. The nation state of course, will always be a dividing nation state. It will always be a kind of creating boundaries. So, if you look at Iqbal's ideas, 
it looks like as if Iqbal was interlocutor between the, his, the ideas that was being produced by many of the scholars or thinkers in India, political thinkers in India and ideas available in Islamic tradition in Quran. He was interlocutor between the two. With these people, he was arguing against modernity, but not against the gains of modernity. He was aware that the, the human beings, by keeping them at the center, actually their self has got that opportunity. So he wanted to retain that and everybody wanted to retain that, but at the same time he had serious epistemological problem with the modernity and he relied upon the epistemological frame of religion. This you can see anybody. Gandhi always said in Hind Swaraj he says that I am not worried that people are becoming religious, I am worried that people are becoming irreligious. He was asked that whether he thinks that the, pand the, the religious teachers should teach religion, the traditional teachers should teach religion. He said, no, I want the Britishers to teach religion. Look at Tagore, Tagore's ideas, religion of man. He does not he doesn't talk about God, he, he begins with human constitution, how human being is constituted, plurality of the structure within human being and how they are united and what that unity probably is the God. He draws upon the bowels. Look at Ambedkar, he gives a critique of Hindu religion, but at the same time he says that, in fact he gives critique of many religions including Buddhism, but at the same time he says that religion is important. And therefore, that even Buddhism has to be reconstituted. So, he argues that there is a principle of religion and there is a rule of religion. And we have to retain the principle of religion and get uh, and change the rules of religion, abolish the rules of religion. Rules of religion may be exploitative. He writes about Marxism and Buddhism and he says that Buddhism has a great advantage. To Ambedkar, Buddhism gives him the idea that human beings are thinking beings, that human beings are spiritual beings. I think Iqbal continues that tradition, is very much in that tradition where he is arguing that the, the philosophy of religion has to be retained and rules of religion need to be transformed. It was his European training, the way he was in Europe, that he could see that if you, if you do not argue philosophically, you would not be able to sustain the argument. Therefore, about religion, about democracy, about nationalism, he is very argumentative, there is nothing emotional about it. Though he always argues that emotion is important, he, as a poet also, he always says that the feeling is important. But when he provides an argument, he is very argumentative, he is very logical, he, he is logically arguing. He refutes the dominance of rationalism very argumentatively, talks of intuition, talks of feelings very argumentatively. I think that was, that was the idea of Iqbal to transform the intellectual collective consciousness at the time, but transformation should be in a direction that there is a continuity with the tradition. So, intervention was required, but the intervention should not be breaking that, that intellectual tradition because he thought lot of, lot of resources were there.
I am coming to the last point. Iqbal, as I said, was the one who wrote about India that Sare Jahan Se Achcha Hindustan Hamara, and he was also a philosopher who imagined Pakistan. What was the kind of reason? Very difficult to understand. But one thing is very clear that he did not want Pakistan as a nation state. He thought that that kind of space, that kind of new entity would provide him a ground for experimenting his ideas and thinking of creating a space which does not believe in the nationalism, which does not believe in nation state and which would also provide him a space for transforming, transforming Islam. I am sure it did not happen and nobody would say that it happened actually and that, what, that always happens with the philosophers that the ideal state is never achieved. But one is, one is very sure about this that in the contemporary world in 21st century, Iqbal has become very, very relevant. He provides us a very coherent thought process to rethink about nationalism, about religion, about democracy. When we are seeing that democracy is, is in crisis all over the world, when we are seeing that the emergence of authoritarian state is on the horizon everywhere in the world, despite having vibrant formal democracy, the Mediterranean democracy is reaching to its limit, Iqbal becomes very important. We see that violence in the name of religion is increasing and then we remember Iqbal that how we can go beyond tolerance and we can have good relation among the religious communities. They are all such communities if they base their ideas on the idea of the self or the Khudi that probably provide a ground for a new kind of thinking about religion and the world. I will stop here. Uh, friends, on that note, we would like to thank Dr. Thakur for coming to our show and we hope that with today's lecture you have come to understand Iqbal's ideas on, on, on Khudi, on, on modernity and on the nation and nation, uh, nationalism as well. We, uh, friends, this is our continuous effort to bring uh, new and knowledgeable uh, lectures for you with every day, with every effort. On that note, thank you dear friends for watching our show. Stay tuned and keep watching. Thank you.